Chapter 27 Who is my neighbor? Based on Luke 10, verses 25 through 37. Among the Jews, the question, Who is my neighbor? caused endless dispute. They had no doubt as to the heathen and the Samaritans. These were strangers and enemies. But where should the distinction be made among the people of their own nation and among the different classes of society? Whom should the priest, the rabbi, the elder regard as neighbor? They spent their lives in a round of ceremonies to make themselves pure. Contact with the ignorant and careless multitude, they taught, would cause defilement that would require wearisome effort to remove. Were they to regard the unclean as neighbors? This question Christ answered in the parable of the Good Samaritan. He showed that our neighbor does not mean merely one of the church or faith to which we belong. It has no reference to race, color, or class distinction. Our neighbor is every person who needs our help. Our neighbor is every soul who is wounded and bruised by the adversary. Our neighbor is everyone who is the property of God. The parable of the Good Samaritan was called forth by a question put to Christ by a doctor of the law. As the Savior was teaching, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The Pharisees had suggested this question to the lawyer in the hope that they might entrap Christ in his words, and they listened eagerly for his answer. But the Savior entered into no controversy. He required the answer from the questioner himself. What is written in the law? he asked. How readest thou? The Jews still accused Jesus of lightly regarding the law given from Sinai, but he turned the question of salvation upon the keeping of God's commandments. The lawyer said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. Thou hast answered right, Christ said, This do, and thou shalt live. The lawyer was not satisfied with the position and works of the Pharisees. He had been studying the Scriptures with a desire to learn their real meaning. He had a vital interest in the matter, and he asked in sincerity, What shall I do? In his answer to the requirements of the law, he passed by all the mass of ceremonial and ritualistic precepts. For these he claimed no value, but presented the two great principles on which hang all the law and the prophets. The Savior's commendation of this answer placed him on vantage ground with the rabbis, They could not condemn him for sanctioning that which had been advanced by an expositor of the law. This do, and thou shalt live, Christ said. In his teaching, he ever presented the law as a divine unity, showing that it is impossible to keep one precept and break another, for the same principle runs through all. Man's destiny will be determined by his obedience to the whole law. Christ knew that no one could obey the law in his own strength. He desired to lead the lawyer to clearer and more critical research that he might find the truth. Only by accepting the virtue and grace of Christ can we keep the law. Belief in the propitiation for sin enables fallen man to love God with his whole heart and his neighbor as himself. The lawyer knew that he had kept neither the first four nor the last six commandments. He was convicted under Christ's searching words, but instead of confessing his sin, he tried to excuse it. Rather than acknowledge the truth, he endeavored to show how difficult of fulfillment the commandment is. Thus he hoped both to parry conviction and to vindicate himself in the eyes of the people. The Savior's words had shown that his question was needless, since he was able to answer it himself. Yet he put another question, saying, Who is my neighbor? Again, Christ refused to be drawn into controversy. He answered the question by relating an incident, the memory of which was fresh in the minds of his hearers. A certain man, he said, went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. In journeying from Jerusalem to Jericho, the traveler had to pass through a portion of the wilderness of Judea. 
The road led down a wild, rocky ravine which was infested with robbers and was often the scene of violence. It was here that the traveler was attacked, stripped of all that was valuable, and left half dead by the wayside. As he lay thus, a priest came that way. He saw the man lying wounded and bruised, weltering in his own blood, but he left him without rendering any assistance. He passed by on the other side. Then a Levite appeared. Curious to know what had happened, he stopped and looked at the sufferer. He was convicted of what he ought to do, but it was not an agreeable duty. He wished that he had not come that way, so that he would not have seen the wounded man. He persuaded himself that the case was no concern of his, and he too passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, traveling the same road, saw the sufferer, and he did the work that the others had refused to do. With gentleness and kindness he ministered to the wounded man. When he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. The priest and the Levite both professed piety, but the Samaritan showed that he was truly converted. It was no more agreeable for him to do the work than for the priest and the Levite, but in spirit and works he proved himself to be in harmony with God. In giving this lesson, Christ presented the principles of the law in a direct, forcible way, showing his hearers that they had neglected to carry out these principles. His words were so definite and pointed that the listeners could find no opportunity to cavile. The lawyer found in the lesson nothing that he could criticize. His prejudice in regard to Christ was removed, but he had not overcome his national dislike sufficiently to give credit to the Samaritan by name. When Christ asked, Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? He answered, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go, and do thou likewise. Show the same tender kindness to those in need. Thus you will give evidence that you keep the whole law. The great difference between the Jews and the Samaritans was a difference in religious belief, a question as to what constitutes true worship. The Pharisees would say nothing good of the Samaritans, but poured their bitterest curses upon them. So strong was the antipathy between the Jews and the Samaritans that to the Samaritan woman it seemed a strange thing for Christ to ask her for a drink. How is it, she said, that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For, adds the evangelist, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. John 4, verse 9. And when the Jews were so filled with murderous hatred against Christ that they rose up in the temple to stone him, they could find no better words by which to express their hatred than, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan, and hast a devil? John 8.48 Yet the priest and Levite neglected the very work the Lord had enjoined on them, leaving a hated and despised Samaritan to minister to one of their own countrymen. The Samaritan had fulfilled the command, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, thus showing that he was more righteous than those by whom he was denounced. Risking his own life, he had treated the wounded man as his brother. This Samaritan represents Christ. Our Savior manifested for us a love that the love of man can never equal. When we were bruised and dying, he had pity upon us. He did not pass us by on the other side and leave us helpless and hopeless to perish. He did not remain in his holy, happy home where he was beloved by all the heavenly host. He beheld our sore need. He undertook our case and identified his interests with those of humanity. He died to save his enemies. He prayed for his murderers. Pointing to his own example, he says to his followers, These things I command you, that ye love one another. 
as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. John 15:17 and 13:34. The priest and the Levite had been for worship to the temple whose service was appointed by God himself. To participate in that service was a great and exalted privilege, and the priest and Levite felt that having been thus honored, it was beneath them to minister to an unknown sufferer by the wayside. Thus they neglected the special opportunity which God had offered them as his agents to bless a fellow being. Many today are making a similar mistake. They separate their duties into two distinct classes. The one class is made up of great things to be regulated by the law of God. The other class is made up of so-called little things in which the command, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, is ignored. This sphere of work is left to caprice, subject to inclination or impulse. Thus the character is marred and the religion of Christ misrepresented. There are those who would think it lowering to their dignity to minister to suffering humanity. Many look with indifference and contempt upon those who have laid the temple of the soul in ruins. Others neglect the poor from a different motive. They are working, as they believe, in the cause of Christ, seeking to build up some worthy enterprise. They feel that they are doing a great work, and they cannot stop to notice the wants of the needy and distressed. In advancing their supposedly great work, they may even oppress the poor. They may place them in hard and trying circumstances, deprive them of their rights, or neglect their needs. Yet they feel that all this is justifiable because they are, as they think, advancing the cause of Christ. Many will allow a brother or a neighbor to struggle unaided under adverse circumstances. Because they profess to be Christians, he may be led to think that in their cold selfishness they are representing Christ. Because the Lord's professed servants are not in cooperation with him, the love of God which should flow forth from them, is in great degree cut off from their fellow men. And a large revenue of praise and thanksgiving from human hearts and human lips is prevented from flowing back to God. He is robbed of the glory due to his holy name. He is robbed of the souls for whom Christ died, souls whom he longs to bring into his kingdom to dwell in his presence through endless ages. Divine truth exerts little influence upon the world when it should exert much influence through our practice. The mere profession of religion abounds, but it has little weight. We may claim to be followers of Christ. We may claim to believe every truth in the Word of God, but this will do our neighbor no good unless our belief is carried into our daily life. Our profession may be as high as heaven, but it will save neither ourselves nor our fellow men unless we are Christians. A right example will do more to benefit the world than all our profession. By no selfish practices can the cause of Christ be served. His cause is the cause of the oppressed and the poor. In the hearts of his professed followers there is need of the tender sympathy of Christ. A deeper love for those whom he has so valued as to give his own life for their salvation. These souls are precious, infinitely more precious than any other offering we can bring to God. To bend every energy towards some apparently great work, while we neglect the needy or turn the stranger from his right, is not a service that will meet his approval. The sanctification of the soul by the working of the Holy Spirit is the implanting of Christ's nature in humanity. Gospel religion is Christ in the life, a living, active principle. It is the grace of Christ revealed in character and wrought out in good works. The principles of the gospel cannot be disconnected from any department of practical life. Every line of Christian experience and labor is to be a representation of the life of Christ. Love is the basis of godliness. Whatever the profession, no man has pure love to God unless he has unselfish love for his brother. But we can never come into possession of this spirit by trying to love others. What is needed is the love of Christ in the heart. When self is merged in Christ, 
love springs forth spontaneously. The completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within, when the sunshine of heaven fills the heart and is revealed in the countenance. It is not possible for the heart in which Christ abides to be destitute of love. If we love God because He first loved us, we shall love all for whom Christ died. We cannot come in touch with divinity without coming in touch with humanity, for in Him who sits upon the throne of the universe, divinity and humanity are combined. Connected with Christ, we are connected with our fellow men by the golden links of the chain of love. Then the pity and compassion of Christ will be manifest in our life. We shall not wait to have the needy and unfortunate brought to us. We shall not need to be entreated to feel for the woes of others. It will be as natural for us to minister to the needy and suffering as it was for Christ to go about doing good. Wherever there is an impulse of love and sympathy, wherever the heart reaches out to bless and uplift others, there is revealed the working of God's Holy Spirit. In the depths of heathenism, men who have had no knowledge of the written law of God, who have never even heard the name of Christ, have been kind to his servants, protecting them at risk of their own lives. Their acts show the working of a divine power. The Holy Spirit has implanted the grace of Christ in the heart of the savage, quickening his sympathies contrary to his nature, contrary to his education. The light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world is shining in his soul, and this light, if heeded, will guide his feet to the kingdom of God. The glory of heaven is in lifting up the fallen, comforting the distressed, and wherever Christ abides in human hearts, he will be revealed in the same way. Wherever it acts, the religion of Christ will bless. Wherever it works, there is brightness. No distinction on account of nationality, race, or caste is recognized by God. He is the maker of all mankind. All men are of one family, by creation, and all are one through redemption. Christ came to demolish every wall of partition, to throw open every compartment of the temple, that every soul may have free access to God. His love is so broad, so deep, so full, that it penetrates everywhere. It lifts out of Satan's circle the poor souls who have been deluded by his deceptions. It places them within reach of the throne of God, the throne encircled by the rainbow of promise. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. All are brought nigh by his precious blood. Galatians 3.28 and Ephesians 2.13 Whatever the difference in religious belief, a call from suffering humanity must be heard and answered. Where bitterness of feeling exists because of difference in religion, much good may be done by personal service. Loving ministry will break down prejudice and win souls to God. We should anticipate the sorrows, the difficulties, the troubles of others. We should enter into the joys and cares of both high and low, rich and poor. Freely ye have received, Christ says, freely give, Matthew 10, verse 8. All around us are poor, tried souls that need sympathizing words and helpful deeds. There are widows who need sympathy and assistance. There are orphans whom Christ has bidden his followers receive as a trust from God. Too often these are passed by with neglect. They may be ragged, uncouth, and seemingly in every way unattractive, yet they are God's property. They have been bought with a price, and they are as precious in His sight as we are. They are members of God's great household, and Christians, as His stewards, are responsible for them. Their souls, He says, will I require at thine hand. Sin is the greatest of all evils, and it is ours to pity and help the sinner. But not all can be reached in the same way. There are many who hide their soul hunger. These would be greatly helped by a tender word or a kind remembrance. There are others who are in the greatest need, yet they know it not. 
they do not realize the terrible destitution of the soul. Multitudes are so sunken in sin that they have lost the sense of eternal realities, lost the similitude of God, and they hardly know whether they have souls to be saved or not. They have neither faith in God nor confidence in man. Many of these can be reached only through acts of disinterested kindness. Their physical wants must first be cared for. They must be fed, cleansed, and decently clothed. As they see the evidence of your unselfish love, it will be easier for them to believe in the love of Christ. There are many who err and who feel their shame and their folly. They look upon their mistakes and errors until they are driven almost to desperation. These souls we are not to neglect. When one has to swim against the stream, there is all the force of the current driving him back. Let a helping hand then be held out to him, as was the elder brother's hand to the sinking Peter. Speak to him hopeful words, words that will establish confidence and awaken love. Thy brother, sick in spirit, needs thee, as thou thyself hast needed a brother's love. He needs the experience of one who has been as weak as he, one who can sympathize with him and help him. The knowledge of our own weakness should help us to help another in his bitter need. Never should we pass by one suffering soul without seeking to impart to him the comfort wherewith we are comforted of God. It is fellowship with Christ, personal contact with a living Savior that enables the mind and heart and soul to triumph over the lower nature. Tell the wanderer of an almighty hand that will hold him up, of an infinite humanity in Christ that pities him. It is not enough for him to believe in law and force, things that have no pity, and never hear the cry for help. He needs to clasp a hand that is warm to trust in a heart full of tenderness. Keep his mind stayed upon the thought of a divine presence ever beside him, ever looking upon him with pitying love. Bid him think of a father's heart that ever grieves over sin, of a father's hand stretched out still, of a father's voice saying, Let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace. Isaiah 27, verse 5. As you engage in this work, you have companions unseen by human eyes. Angels of heaven were beside the Samaritan who cared for the wounded stranger. Angels from the heavenly court stand by all who do God's service in ministering to their fellow men. And you have the cooperation of Christ himself. He is the restorer. And as you work under his supervision, you will see great results. Upon your faithfulness in this work, not only the well-being of others, but your own eternal destiny depends. Christ is seeking to uplift all who will be lifted to companionship with himself, that we may be one with him as he is one with the Father. He permits us to come in contact with suffering and calamity in order to call us out of our selfishness. He seeks to develop in us the attributes of his character, compassion, tenderness, and love. By accepting this work of ministry, we place ourselves in his school to be fitted for the courts of God. By rejecting it, we reject his instruction and choose eternal separation from his presence. If thou wilt keep my charge, the Lord declares, I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by, even among the angels that surround his throne. Zechariah 3 verse 7. By cooperating with heavenly beings in their work on earth, we are preparing for their companionship in heaven. Ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation, Hebrews 1.14, angels in heaven will welcome those who on earth have lived not to be ministered unto, but to minister, Matthew 20, verse 28. In this blessed companionship we shall learn to our eternal joy, all that is wrapped up in the question, Who is my neighbor?